before, the picture was computer contrast enhanced. And after, late that evening, we were able to make that same picture into this one. And what is it? Well, there seem to be a number of holes on it, which are probably craters, a giant one up at the top, and uh, others in various places. And it, I don't know what it's in various places. And it, I don't know what a giant artificial satellite looks like, but this doesn't seem to be it. This looks more like a diseased potato. <laughs> a few weeks later, we came very close to Phobos, about 5,000 kilometers away, and obtained this view. And we can see that it is an old, battered, irregular object. In fact, it turns out to be about as old as the solar system. Uh, it has seen large numbers of collisions. It does not seem to be an artificial satellite. And now, more recently, with the Viking mission, we have been able to obtain still closer up pictures. And here we can see a set of quite remarkable furrows and grooves running along here. In fact, the Viking spacecraft was able to be maneuvered within something like 100 kilometers of Phobos. We could have crashed it into Phobos if we wished to. It would have been stupid at first, but we could have done it. And close-ups of these grooves have also been obtained. The reason for these furrows or grooves is still being debated. One interesting idea is that they are produced by the tides of Mars. The gravity of Mars is tearing at Phobos. And perhaps in time, Phobos will be torn into pieces by these tides. And perhaps that is the origin of uh, other fragmented features, for example, the rings of Saturn. It's a possibility. Also, Phobos is a very dark object. And now it appears to be made of organic material. Uh, and therefore may say something about the pre-biological organic chemistry in the early history of the solar system. It is a fascinating object. I'll say something more about it in a moment. But uh, let's take a look, brief look at Deimos. Uh, you can see Deimos is not quite the same as Phobos. It does seem smoother. The two large craters that you see here have names. One of the marvelous things about this kind of exploration is we can name things. And uh, we can put all our favorite people on these objects, provided they're dead. Um, and so the two craters you see here have been named Voltaire and Swift, after Voltaire and Swift, for reasons which I've already described. Now, Phobos itself looks like this. This is a model of Phobos, uh, made after Mariner 9, but not including any of the recent Viking data. And it, you can see what an irregular object it is. It has seen catastrophes. It is mute witness to cataclysms in the early solar system. Pieces have been broken off. Holes have been gouged. Things were very violent a long time ago in the vicinity of Phobos. Uh, here is a great piece that's been carved out. In fact, some people think that Phobos and Deimos were once both part of the same object, which was split in some great catastrophe and broken into two satellites. Anyway, the big, the big craters here we have named. We certainly wanted to name one after Hall. He discovered the moons, after all. But we also wanted to name one after Mrs. Hall, because there seems to be good evidence that they would not have been discovered without Mrs. Hall's urging. But we can't call both craters Hall, Hall and Hall, because then who will know which one we're talking about at any given moment? So we had to find out what Mrs. Hall's maiden name was before she became Mrs. Hall. Not so easy to do. And I once was giving a lecture at Harvard University in which I complained about how difficult this was. And a colleague of mine, Owen Gingerich, professor of the history of science at Harvard, who was in fact in England at this moment, uh, stood up and said in a loud voice, Angelina Stickney, he said, um, which is, in fact, Mrs. Hall's maiden name. And so we have two important features on Mars called Hall and Stickney. Hall is here, quite nice, uh, large. But Stickney is here and is, in fact, the largest feature, uh, largest crater 
on Mars. And uh, so I think we have done the appropriate kinds of commemoration. Now, there is a kind of lesson. The moons of Mars are without doubt of extremely great interest. And uh, they are either captured asteroids or pieces left over from the formation of Mars. And uh, if they are truly rich in organic matter, but even if they're not, they're objects well worth deep study. But the idea that they are artificial satellites is surely wrong, just as the idea that Mars is covered with green vegetation is surely wrong, just as the idea that Mars is circled with a network of canals constructed by a race of beings enamored of hydraulic engineering is wrong. These ideas were proposed before there was enough data. They were charming ideas. They were driven in part by uh, our interest in, uh, in the possibility of life elsewhere, and that is an important goal to look for life elsewhere. But they also were, to some extent, distorted by our interest in finding life elsewhere. And there is a lesson. The lesson is, accept only the most rigorous standards of argument. Do not accept inadequate, poorly thought out, flawed arguments, especially where our emotions are involved. And that's a point which will be most important when we consider in subsequent lectures the possibility of life on the surface of Mars with more sophisticated instruments. Now, since these early times, many more observations about Mars have been found. For example, one such observation made from a high altitude aircraft, not by a space vehicle, is a spectrum. The brightness of Mars versus wavelength. Brightness in the vertical scale here, wavelength in the horizontal, showing an absorption feature, this dip. It's very much like the spectral lines we talked about in the last lecture. And this is due to water. Not liquid water, but water chemically combined with the rocks and soil of Mars. It's a very big feature, and therefore means there's a great deal of water on Mars. Could some of it be in the liquid form? We don't know. But the exist at this point, we don't know. But the existence of lots of water on Mars is a slight encouragement for those who like to think about the possibility of life there. The possibility of life on Mars has infused itself into Sunday supplements and science fiction and romantic novels, um, starting, by the way, with uh, Percival Lowell's uh, marvelous but erroneous popularization. And so, for example, it's possible to go to places as far afield as Peru um, and see, in this case, on a door in a rural place in Peru, a sign which says, Se vende marcianos. Here we sell Martians. Now, if only that were literally true, we could save ourselves a great deal of effort by just going to Peru and purchasing a few Martians. But it turns out that those Martians are candy bars, rather like our Martians, both in the United States and the United Kingdom. There are Mars bars, which have nothing to do with Mars, so far as I know, uh, except that Mars is thought to be a nice thing. The idea of looking for life on another planet is a splendid idea. It is properly a focus of our enthusiasms and our interests. But, as I said before, we must be very careful about the kinds of arguments we use. The only way to really find out about life on a planet like Mars is to go there. And therefore, it requires close-up space vehicle exploration of the planets.